Welcome to another incredible episode of the Brand Gravity Show. I am your host, psychology-driven brand strategist, Kay Putnam, guiding you into the mind-bending intersection of branding and psychology. And as we unravel the threads of what makes consumers choose certain brands, we gain insight into the levers that we can pull as brand builders. Today, we're diving into the deep end of our pool of knowledge and our guest truly embodies the concept of gravity. He is a force that draws people in and exudes immense power and influence. Talking to somebody who has not only proven himself to be a successful business heavyweight, but has also turned the tables on conventional wisdom. Can't wait for you to hear. With me today is the dynamic, distinctive, and energetic business genius, Matthew Pollard. He is a master sales systemization coach and an expert in niche marketing. He's more than just a theorist. His real world experience has powered over 3,500 business transformations and counting. He's had five multi-million dollar business successes before the age of 30. He's an internationally award-winning blogger, sought after speaker, known for his electrifying and ROI driven presentations. And also the author of the bestseller, The Introvert's Edge, How the Quiet and Shy Can Outsell anyone. And to me, a truly inspirational figure who against all odds has risen to become a powerhouse of brand differentiation. He's a symbol of what can happen when you align your passion with your profession and you dare to do things in your own way. So get ready to be inspired, get ready to learn as we talk to the rapid growth guy himself, Matthew Pollard. Matthew, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm so excited to chat and to dive into your wisdom and expertise. I would love to start with a story if you're open to that. Was there a moment where you felt like your being an introvert was an advantage instead of something that needed to be overcome or yeah, well, that's a really good question. So first, I'm ecstatic to be here too. So thank you for having me and letting us kind of talk about this topic, right? That I think is really important to those people that think that introverts are kind of second-class citizens. The truth is we're not, and I, I say we're not because it's important, you know, I am an introvert. And by the way, it's not something you can change. You hear people say, oh, I was an introvert in the past, but I'm not anymore. We can talk about that, but that's that that's not possible. But for, for someone like me, I, I think it's the power of retrospect. And I I, what I mean by that is I learned, and we talk about how I learned, but I learned sales as a system. And if I was to look back on that, I, I, it wasn't a natural ability, right? So because it wasn't a natural ability, I had to find another path, but I leaned in. I think a lot of people try to be extroverted. I lean into planning, preparation. I need to feel authentic when I'm um, selling, marketing myself. I need to feel congruent with all of that. And those bulldog techniques, the hard closes, the going to networking rooms and say, I do this for this group of people, even if I have this common, pro- they have this common problem. So I just couldn't do any of that. So for me, I went, well, how can I do it in a different way? And what I realized is that that didn't even work that well for extroverts. Like it works better than what most introverts are doing. Don't get me wrong. But the, if you can do it in an authentic way, you can plan and prepare it correctly. And yeah, I mean, that's where I look back. And that's where the concept of the introvert's edge came out because you know, when I, you know, I learned to sell, I mean, it was 93 doors before my first sale. I shouldn't have been in sales because I, I mean, I lost my job just before Christmas. It was, you know, Christmas and summer coincides in Australia. So everyone's off for a month. And because of that, I just, there was only one job I could get commission only sales. So I applied for that. It was terrifying for me, especially one day I'll show you a photo of me with terrible acne and, you know, braces, but you know, I was uncomfortable around my own friends, let alone anyone else. But what happened after 93 doors before my first sale, because no one taught me how to sell, they just taught me about the product. I had to go and figure it out. And I I taught myself watching YouTube videos. And what I realized is that most extroverts just, I mean, they wing it, right? And it works better for them than it does for, for us introverts. For most introverts, they assume that they can't learn. They either have to have this gift of gabble, they don't have it. So they don't put in the effort. What I decided is, well, most people don't put in the effort because what's the point in running a marathon if you realize you're not even going to get halfway? So no one tries. And I think that's the problem with a lot of small businesses. They do what I call busy procrastination. They hide away from these important topics that allow them to create rapid growth because they don't think they can do them. They know it's not possible for them. They know it. And that's where they're wrong. And so what I've realized, and you know, I think I knew it back then because I realized through planning and preparation that I was able to succeed. I mean, it was went from 93 doors for my first sale to every day practicing for eight hours, 
out at home watching YouTube videos, then going out and applying what I learned for the next eight hours. Weekends, I'd spend 16 hours practicing. I get it. It doesn't sound fun. But within six weeks, the number of doors it took me to make a sale went from, you know, 93 to 61 to 24 to 18 to nine down to three. Six weeks in, I, I got taken to an office where I was assuming they were bringing me, me in to fire me because they all just looked puzzled. And they told me I was the number one salesperson in the company, which just so happened to be the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. I think at that point, I knew to a science that my introversion gave me a strength, which is that I was willing to do what most people won't. Now, for the small business owners that are listening, I'm not suggesting you do that. The truth is to be good at sales, especially if you follow a system, which no one told me, you can learn it really quickly. You don't have to be as good as me. I was the number one in the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. To be good at sales in your own small business, you don't even really need to be that good, but you just need to put some effort into it. And then they, I mean, they promoted me and I was terrible at management. They gave me 20 sales reps. They all quit in 24 hours. But then planning, preparation, learning the strategies, I got good at that. And then fast forward just shy of a decade, I'd been responsible for five multi-million dollar success stories. If I'm to look back through that career, what allowed me to be successful was my willingness to take responsibility. And I think that was a big one that I can't blame the world for my issues. I have to make it my problem. I mean, my sales manager, the first job I had, told me that he was quitting within the week because commission only is a rubbish place to be, right? If I had blamed him, I had every excuse in the sun to say that this was not going to work. I, it was Christmas time. I could have blamed the fact that everybody wants to go on holidays. They're about to take a month off. I took responsibility. I then lived in what if thinking and said, what if there was another way? Well, sales would have to be a system. Okay, where would I learn it? Well, I can't read a book. By the way, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader back then. I literally had this pair of funny colored lenses I put on and it helps me read, right? But I, I had to start the process of learning to read at 16. So I had every reason to not take responsibility, but I'd learned by taking responsibility, by living in what if, that's how we discovered the glasses. My mother went, what if there was a solution? And then a willingness to do the work, I was able to succeed. And I think all introverts, as long as they believe that they can, they're willing to do the work. They're willing to put good effort behind something. And they're also really willing to plan and prepare. I mean, we can't help ourselves, right? We, we either spend our time at night catastrophizing or ruminating or planning and preparing. I prefer planning and pre preparing. At least that's continuous improvement and perfecting instead of ruminating, right? Reflecting on what one improvement you can have. That's when I realized it was an advantage. But I think it was only when I started to teach people what I was doing that I realized that introverts gravitated it to it more, but it, they gravitated to it more because we're kind of terrible at sales and marketing without it, right? So I feel like we have an edge because we're willing to do the work. And that's why we run circles around extroverts because those extroverts at the short term, they do well, but just like Michael Jordan wasn't the best player originally, but became the best player. Just like, you know, I wasn't one of the best salespeople originally, but became the best sales. The ones that are willing to iterate, work on themselves and grow rather than just wing it and take what they have for granted, they're the ones that will always have the edge. Amazing, amazing. And there's about 17,000 questions I could ask from there, but I wanted to tease out one detail that you mentioned kind of offhand. You said that a lot of small businesses avoid the work that's actually going to grow their business. And I know in addition to your five successes, you've also transformed thousands of small businesses through your work. What are some of those specific actions that will multiply a business's success? Well, I mean, it's really simple. I mean, most people focus on fixing sales if they want to make more sales. But especially for us introverts, like that's like the most uncomfortable place to be trying to fix the problem, right? Because at that point, they're like, you know, you go to a networking room and people ask you what it is you do. And you say, well, I know if I say I'm a sales trainer, people look at me like I'm one step above a scam artist, right? That's not a good place to start. Well, if I say I'm in marketing, they're like, oh, I need a marketer. How much do you cost? Now I'm talking about price. I just met them. So I'm stuck in this bad situation because I commoditized myself. Now, occasionally they might say, oh, well, you know, I've already got a marketer and that's even worse. Right now I've got to do this dance. Oh, I'm different. I've got magic ruby slippers. Yeah, right. So the thing you've got to understand is that you have to be more methodical. And what I mean by this is people, I mean, they may listen to podcasts like this. They may read books, they, but they don't actively work on this stuff. And what they, the reason for that is they don't actually know what's going to pay the biggest bit dividend. So what happens, they gravitate to things like shiny objects, like Facebook or webinars or do this thing that, I mean, there's people that say, just post photos on Instagram every day of life. I'm not going to be that guy that takes a photo of my donut for something to say online. Like 
It's ridiculous. So the thing is that as an introvert, I had to lean into planning and preparation and planning and preparation starts way before working out, you know, what you say in a networking room. And actually, let me give you an example. I, I worked with this client, Wendy. She was a language coach out of California and she taught kids and adults Mandarin. And for the longest time, she'd done that and she charged 50 to $80 an hour. But this is the world we live in. There were all these people moving from other states into California and they were starting their own Mandarin education businesses to get your first clients you charge less. They were charging 30 to $40 an hour. So not only was she dealing with that, thanks to this global economy we live in, there are now people in China offering to do it for $12 an hour on Craigslist. And thanks to our friends in Silicon Valley, there's now technology available. You know, I'll teach you Mandarin, you teach me English. We just won't charge anyone anything. So now she's competing against free. So she comes to me and she's like, how do I compete in this crowded market? What she was looking for was a sales solution to convince customers, to conjole customers, to pay extra for her because she was losing customers like crazy and she was struggling to get new ones. And what I said is, no, let's just avoid the battle altogether. So what I did is I looked at all the clients that she worked with over the years and really, I mean, there was only two people that she'd worked with, but she did these amazing things for them. Now, these were executives being relocated to China. Now, she helped them understand these really critical things, like the difference between e-commerce in China and the Western world, the importance of respect, like why learning the language isn't enough. You've got to reduce your accent, how to handle a business card and why it matters so much. But more importantly, the difference in rapport, like if I was really bad at sales in the US and I said something, you know, at the end of 45 minutes, I'd say something horrible like, so do you want to move forward? And you would say, yes, no, or everyone's favorite. Let me think about it. Well, if I said a week from now, the same question, you said the same thing, my chances of getting that sale are going down and down. Yet in China, they're going to want to see you discuss, they're not going to want to discuss business. Five or six times, they're not even going to want to talk about business. They're going to want to meet with you. They're probably going to want to see you drunk over karaoke once or twice. These are the characters you're dealing with, but they're doing it because they're talking about 20 to 50 year deals, not transactional agreements and 12 month contracts. So it's about the character of the person. And she helped them understand this mind blowing stuff. And I'm like, this is huge. You're doing so much more for these people. What are you doing? Now, here's the thing. She was stuck in her functional skill. She couldn't see how amazing these things are. And by the way, everyone listening right now, I want you to know you're doing the exact same types of things for your customers. Nobody pays a higher price. Every time they pay your bill, don't think they haven't thought about it. They consider why they're paying a higher price for you. So if you charge more than the cheapest, there's a reason for that. If somebody is in a networking room and somebody says, oh, I'm looking for a graphic designer. Like, oh my gosh, you got to use this person. They're not doing that because you give them a vanilla what everyone else could. There is something unique about you. And I was like, Wendy, you are stuck in your functional skill. Is it fair to assume as a result of the assistance you're giving these people, they're going to be more successful when they go to China? She's like, I mean, yeah, that's the point, right? I said, great, let's call, let's call you the China Success Coach. Let's create a program called the China Success Intensive, which worked out to be a five-week program that worked with the executive, the spouse, and any children. So now we've got this unique messaging. The next question is, how do you sell it, right? So what we did is we said, well, who do you think you should sell it to? And she said, well, obviously the executive. Well, that makes sense. I mean, I moved from Australia to the United States. I was terrified. Imagine going to China. I just didn't think it was the right client. She's like, well, the company would pay. I'm like, that makes sense. I mean, I would... I mean, companies have millions of dollars riding on the executive being successful sometimes. Still don't think it's the right client. Now she's frustrated. She's like, well, who then? And I said, I think your ideal client is the immigration attorney. Now she looks at me like I'm speaking a different language. And I'm like, think about it. They make five to $7,000 for doing all the paperwork, all the bureaucracy that comes with doing a visa. They've got to get a client, which isn't cheap. They've got rent to pay. They've got office staff. They've got office space. They've got staff. They'd be lucky to make $3,000 at the end of that. I said, just offer them $3,000 for a simple introduction. So she went to networking events. She suggested this to people. And they're like, double my profit for a simple introduction? What do I have to say? She said, just this. Just say, congratulations, you've got your visa. I just want to double check you're as ready as possible to be relocated to China. They would respond with, yeah, I think so. You know, we've got our place sorted. We've got our visa now. Thank you. We're learning the language. Kids are getting pretty good at it too. I think we're good. And they would just respond with this. There's a lot more to it than that. I think you need to speak to the China success coach. Wendy would then get on the phone with this terrified person with an organization motivated to pay, recommended by their attorney. She charged $30,000 for this. Minus a $3,000 commission, she made $27,000 for the easiest sale in the world. This is what I mean about fixing it before you get to sales. By saying, what do I do outside the scope of my functional skill? What's the higher level benefit? China success. Then what specific niche makes the most sense? Sales becomes a lot easier. For me, for instance, I'm a branding expert. I'm a social media strategist. I'm a sales expert. I'm a master in NLP. Who cares? Nobody does. They don't care how hard it was for me to learn these things, how long I spent learning them. But when I say I'm the rapid growth guy and I work 
I specialize with helping introverted service providers obtain rapid growth. It's the simplicity of that message that gets me heard in the crowd of marketplace. So I don't have to take a photo of my donut. I get heard, but also allows people to see me as the only logical choice, which makes sales. Heck yes. Heck yes. One of the things that you're demonstrating so beautifully is the power of stories right now as we're speaking. And I know that storytelling is a part of the system. Can you explain the role that it plays in sales? Sure. So firstly, I'm never comfortable when I'm selling, right? I And what I mean by that, I'm a lot more comfortable now, but when I first meet someone, it's not comfortable for me. So I have a way of developing rapport and relationship because even small talk is not something I'm great at, right? So for me, I have systemized small talk, but I want to get to story as quickly as possible because a study out of Princeton highlights that when you tell a story, this thing, what happens is my brain and your brain and everybody listening's brain automatically synchronizes. It creates artificial rapport. This thing called neurocoupling means that we're developing artificial rapport, that we introverts are great at turning into real rapport, which is powerful. Like when I speak from stage, the first thing I do is I say, thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction. How will I live up to such a wonderful introduction? I know. Let me tell you about Wendy. Why do I do that? Because that piece, before I get to the story, I feel so uncomfortable. I start telling the story and I watch everyone just go, oh, we like him. And all of a sudden I feel comfortable. So that's one superpower. The other thing is people remember up to 22 times more information when embedded into a story. And what's hilarious is people, you know, people always struggle to believe this. And so I will literally say to people, like I'll pick somebody up from stage and I'll say, we're gonna, we're gonna run this as a study because it's hard to believe. And I'll just find someone in the audience and I'll say, all right, I want you to remember these three items for me. I don't want you to write them down. I just want you to remember them. Are you good with that? And they'll say, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I say, great, let's think about it. Chairs. My Australian accent, I have to explain what that is. So I'm like, you know, the thing you sit on, porridge, you know, the thing you eat for breakfast and beds, you know, the thing that you're probably looking forward to sleeping in tonight. And I then say those three items and I say, okay, you've got them. And they're like, yes, I've got them. I'm like, great. A year from now, I'm going to call you out of the blue. I'm going to ask you what those items are. And they, their eyes explode like yours just did. And I, they like, I'm like, what do you think your chances are? And they're like, no, maybe no, no. And then I'm like, oh, have a bit more confidence in yourself. What about everyone else? Put your hands up if you think they'll remember it. Nobody puts their hands up. And I'm like, how dare you have such little confidence in, in your colleague here? What if I was to tell you the story of Goldilocks and the three bears, sat in some chairs, ate some porridge, slept in some beds. And everyone's like, oh, got it. That means that this instant recall happens just three inanimate objects that don't go together in this story everybody remembers. When I used to go and sell things, I knew that people remember more of what I told them than everybody else combined. You know, you could have 10 sales reps there. They'd remember more of what I told them than all of them combined if I just told it into a story. Now, for those introverts here or the functional service providers that are used to spewing factual information at people or coaching people on the fly and networking events because that's supposed to get clients, it never does. What you do wrong is spew out that information that it doesn't feel tangible. It feels overwhelming. It feels like a high fire hose of information or a fire hose of advice, which they didn't ask for. So it's also annoying to them. So when you tell a story, it does a few things. Firstly, it sidesteps any objections or concerns they have because you're telling a story about somebody else's problem. So they're living it in that. They're trying it on. So it's less assertive but they're also seeing it as tangible, just like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. So they're going to remember all the items in the story. More than that, there's, this, there's studies to show that when you tell a story, it short circuits the logical brain and you speak directly to the emotional brain. Now, if you're wondering what the difference is, if you're in a networking event and they're telling you all the reasons why that won't work for them or that their situation is different, that's the logical brain like telling them it won't work. That's also the part of the brain if you're cold calling it says, this won't work for me and hanging up. When you tell a story, it literally short circuits that part of the brain. The emotional center of the brain literally goes, story time, and it listens. And it assumes all the detail in the story as factual. And this is key. Take this with a duty of care. If you sell a, don't use fake stories. And if you sell a bad product, do not follow my system because I do not want it to work for you. Life is too short. Sell something you truly believe in. But if you believe in it, and I want you to truly hear me with this, if you believe in what you sell, then 
go to the true definition of sales. The true definition of sales was derived from the Scandinavian term to serve. And the best way to serve your customers is to get them out of their own way. If you sell a bad product, don't do that. If you sell a great product that will make their life better, use story to get them out of their own way to get them to the outcome. Otherwise, somebody else that sells a bad product will charge them more to rip them off as opposed to what you can do. So story, short-circuiting their logical mind and living in that emotional center means, and we've tried this with cold callers that struggle to get C-level executives to stay on the phone from a cold call for eight seconds. Telling a story keeps them on the phone for over two and a half minutes on average. Think about what you can do with that time. Now go into a networking event, for instance. If you can't articulate the value of what you provide when somebody's politely listening for two and a half minutes, what chance do you have online? So if you don't have your version of the rapid growth guide, the China success coach, you don't know your niche. So people see you as the only logical choice to work with, that they're willing to pay you what you're worth for your uniqueness. And you don't have a story that people can try on that is motivational and inspirational while coming across as educational then you're always going to struggle. But when you have that stuff, and what's funny, my first book's on sales, my second book's on networking. And the last chapter, I tell you what I've been trying to do, which is I'm showing you how to master the networking room so you never have to go back to one. Because what I learned is if you can make your message so, so clear, you never have to go back to the networking room because people will find you and chase you online because they're like, finally, somebody that gets me. And I've had people wait three months to get a phone call with me. Think about the world that we live in today and how much disruption. And people will wait three months to have a conversation with me because they didn't want to speak to anyone else. They wanted to speak to me. Yet most people can't even get people to show up for a phone call they booked yesterday. Yes. Yes. I would love to dig into the tactics just a little bit here. So clearly, if we want to learn the whole system, we have the book that we can return to. And it's an incredible resource. What is your own process for developing and crafting these stories? How do you, what does that look like for you? Well, so it actually starts from, I like to say uh, the, the heart. I mean, that sounds a little bit fluffy, but it, it does. I mean, so firstly, here's the one thing I want to tell you. Create, I've learned you can create rapid growth out of anything. There is nothing worse than a rapid growth business with customers you can't stand in a business you don't like. Now, I know a lot of people listening are like, Matt, it's easy for you to say you've made some successful businesses. You have the luxury of making that choice. Yeah, I do. But I've also made the mistake of making the wrong choice. So the thing that I want to tell you is usually if it's connected with your passion and mission, you'll have more energy. It won't feel like work. You'll make more money. And I've discovered that now time and time again for both me and my clients and all the people that just hear my stuff. And again, you don't need to work with me to embrace this content, right? Like if you want to develop your own version of the China success coach, the rapid growth guy and find your niche, just go to matthewpollard.com forward slash growth. There's a template there, download it. It's a five-step template. Don't do it by yourself, please. And don't do it with someone. Like if you're a business coach, do it with a florist. If you're a florist, do it with a, an attorney or a graphic designer, right? Get somebody else to listen to this podcast and then do it with them and spend an hour on them, spend an hour on you and you'll find you'll be miles ahead. Like I did this at the National Freelance Conference, 200 people in the room. I'm just sitting at the top of the stage, working them through exactly what you've just heard, right? So at the end of the session, I said, put your hand up if you now believe you have your version of the China Success Coach and you've identified your niche, you know, a group, a message that will excite and inspire and a niche you've identified that will pay you what you're worth that see you as the only logical choice. 97% of the room put their hands up. Sounds great until I tell you, I said, keep your hand up. Just do me a favor. Keep your hand up if this is the most time you spent actively working on your marketing. And the reason why I say actively, and this is really critical, listening to the, what I've just done for you does not count because I've told you what to do. Until you do it, it is pointless. And here's the thing. 85% of the room had kept their hands up. The whole session was 90 minutes long. People do the busy work. They listen to stuff that makes them feel like they're moving forward. That's just busy procrastination. If you want to move beyond that, go to matthewpollard.com forward slash growth, download the free template, do it with somebody else. They'll get you out of your functional skill. They just need to not be in the same industry and you'll be miles further ahead than where you are. But a lot of times people say, well, there's a couple of niches and this one I can make mo the most money out of, so I should do that. No, do the one you're most pas passionate about, especially in this global economy. That makes the most sense. So what I've decided that makes the most difference when you're thinking about story, you have to be more strategic and you have to say, okay, 
what mission am I on? Like, what do I love seeing in the world? What do I hate seeing in the world? And what mission can I have to make the what I hate to see what I love to see? Or what change do I want to see in the world? And how can I make that different? For instance, I love helping underdogs. But the truth is, I can't help every underdog. So if I had to choose, it would be small business owners, but I can't help all small business owners. So if I had to choose, it would be service providers, because they've got their heart on their sleeve, and they have to work with people every day. But if I can't work with all of them, who would I really like to work with? introverts. Why? Because they have a lot more burdens to bear. But if I can't work with all of them, what group? Well, business coaches, because if I want to help small businesses, then obviously helping business coaches that help small businesses allows me to help more small businesses and I'm making a bigger impact. So I started with just helping. I was the rapid growth guy for introverted business coaches. Then I grew out to all coaches, then all professional service providers, then all service providers. Now I help pretty much every introvert on the planet, but my brand's big enough to support that. But when you think about that, now I know introverted service providers. I then ask myself, what are the three major problems that they have? And then I say, well, what are the three major outcomes they're looking for? And then I say, what is a story? And I keep it super simple. I say, what is a story that I have of a person that had this problem that I got to an outcome? For instance, my three steps in niche marketing, different. I help Wendy with all that plus much, much more. But if I had have told you about all of that during this story today, it would have overwhelmed you with unnecessary information. The thing that had the biggest impact was that. With another story I tell, the thing that had the biggest impact was sales, systemization, something else, niching. So I keep my stories completely compartmentalized what happens is when you do that and you write the story, by the way, you think you tell great stories, you're wrong, right? Most people tell stories, customer wanted this, so we gave it to them. I'm talking about a story that is more like a theatrical masterpiece, the story more like how you met your husband or wife, right? At the start, maybe if it's like mine, you know, at the start, it was a little bulky. We took some things out. There were some things people enjoyed. We kind of embellished on that a little bit. I mean, now, you know, I say certain things. My wife says certain things. We hold each other's hands. We look at each other. I mean, it's a performance. It's amazing. Your stories should be the same, truthful, but engaging. And it's the emotional fabric and the moral of the story that is, pow is powerful. But usually people are so vanilla. Oh, we had a customer that wanted that. We got them the result. Nobody cares. That's not a story. That's a CNN. That's a news channel eyewitness account. And nobody tunes in for that stuff. They'll watch three hour movies. They get bored with the news in 30 seconds. So you've got to structure your story well. Once you have all of that, then you have the tools to network well and sell well. And I'll give you an example to show you that it's worth the effort. Most people go into networking rooms and they say things like, oh, you know, I'm a marketing specialist and we do things like SEO and pay-per-click advertising and email campaigns and people are like, when's he going to stop? Oh my gosh. Or they say, oh, you know, we, we specialize with helping this group of people, you know, small businesses obtain growth in their business, even if they have this common objection, you know, which could be, you know, even if they think they can't sell. To me, that just feels so yuck. Like it feels scripted and robotic and you can't really say it passionately because it would sound like an infomercial. I hope this group of people with this product, yuck, like horrible. So, but now you have your passion and mission. If you go into a networking event and you're first interested before you're uh, interesting, right? I.e., talk, ask them what they do to the point where they're like, oh my God, I've been talking about myself for like 15 minutes. I haven't even asked you what it is that you do. And you respond with something as simple as, oh, thanks for asking. I'm the rapid growth guy. Just like they asked you if you're an accountant. And then when they go, sorry, that doesn't fit in one of the boxes I have, right? Like, oh, that's interesting. What exactly is that? Well, then I respond with, well, one of the things I love to see more than anything in the world is an amazing introverted service provider with enough talent, skill, and belief in themselves to go and start a business of their own. But what I find, I just hate seeing this. They get stuck in this endless hamster wheel of struggling to find interest to people, trying to set themselves apart, trying to make the sale, really feeling like people only care about one thing, price. Do you know anyone like that? Now, when I ask that, if I've gone to the right networking room, and by the way, if I've planned and prepared, I've even connected with the people I want to speak to in that networking room beforehand so that I don't have to you know, go in and talk to some rando that I've never met before that probably wants to sell me insurance. So then they're going to respond with, yes, I have. I, I do know that someone like that. Or yes, I'm like that. And I say, great. Well, well, you know, I'm on a mission to help introverts just like you realize that you, you really can have a rapid growth business doing what you love, but not by getting better at your functional skill. I mean, I'm sure you're amazing at that. Most introverts especially are because they focus on really crafting their profession really well and getting great at it. Not, but you're not a second-class citizen either. Your path to success is just different. You just need to focus on three things outside the scope of your functional skill that will really allow you to build a business that revolves around you, your family, and your life, not the other way around. Let me give you an example. Then I might tell the story of Wendy. Now, think about how on the hook they are at that point. 
And notice I still haven't told you what I do. I didn't say sales. I didn't say marketing. I didn't talk about any junk. They don't care that you could say, you know what? I'm going to give you this pen, put it in the middle of your desk and your sales will double for the rest of your life. I would never move that pen if it proved to be true, right? They don't care if it's sales advice or marketing advice. All they heard was, I love seeing this. I hate seeing this. And I'm on a mission to do that. All they heard was I was here to serve this group and I'm passionate about it. And when they hear that, I, firstly, I can, it's hard to say I love to see this, hate to see this, mission to do this without being passionate, right? So you can bring in passion, you can build in authenticity, and you're not bragging about yourself. So we introverts feel authentic because all of a sudden we feel like we're truly being ourselves. And because we plan and prepared, we've practiced making sure that we demonstrate the best version of ourselves. And we've practiced our story for the same reason. Mm, amazing. So we can go to matthewpollard.com slash growth and get that exercise that you suggested earlier. I think we're also going to put a link to a free chapter of the introvert's edge in the show notes as well. Is there anything else that you want people to know about before I ask the final question? No, absolutely. I, I think, I think a lot of people overcomplicate it. And I, what I mean by that is, and just so you know, my, my book, the introvert's edge has how to put it? It has the word introvert on the cover. And yes, it is the only one with the word introvert on the cover, but there are lots of other amazing salespeople that are also introverted that could teach you too. I just happen to put the word introvert on the cover, which is why it sold 100,000 copies and it's in 16 languages. So I'm not saying you need to follow my system. I'm saying you need to follow a system. Now, here's what people mostly do. They treat sales like mixed martial arts. They tr read a bunch of books and they try and piece it all together to the perfect system. You don't... I mean, these people that wrote books, they know more than you. Just trust the system that you're learning and follow that system to the letter. Sure, once you get great at sales, you can change one thing at a time. Treat sales like a science experiment. Use that brain that ruminates for continuous improvement instead. It's powerful. If you want to use my system, you don't even need to buy my book. Go to the introvertsedge.com. Yes, you can download the first chapter there. If you do nothing more, Firstly, I'll, I'll help you believe you can sell as an introvert in the first chapter. But if you grab the seven-step framework, just grab what you currently say and put it in there. The first thing you'll realize is some things don't fit. Throw that out. You shouldn't say it to customers. The second thing you'll realize is some things out of order, which is probably why you're getting asked about price too soon. And then you'll realize there's some gaping holes, usually around asking the right questions and telling great stories. If you do nothing more than that, just putting your sale in order, you'll double your sales in the next 60 days. Now, if your real thing you want to achieve is networking, then go to the introvertsedging.com and I'll do the exact same thing for you to network, uh, to network. For me, the biggest thing for everyone to learn today is to A, believe they can and do one action. So don't download the growth template, the sales chapter and the networking chapter and do it all. Just pick one of those and do one of those because you either want to focus on sales or focus on networking or focus on the message. I'd focus on the message first because that'll benefit all of those. However, what most people do is you'll download all of it. You'll then watch a bunch of my YouTube videos. You'll read seven other books on the topic. And guess what? It's now overcomplicated. So you go back to busy procrastination and you will do nothing. I didn't coin this term, but I've heard somebody call it procrasta learning before, and I can completely resonate. I do that myself sometimes. I was going to ask you what the first step that somebody should take after listening, but you already answered that question beautifully. So I'm going to ask a different question. Can you share, how do you know that, that introverts can do this? Well, just because I've seen thousands of them do it, tens of thousands do it. So I, funnily enough, some of my best clients are engineers. Right. And the reason being is because engineers are terrible communicators a lot of the time. Sorry if you're an engineer listening. I have, you know, my brain, that's just the way it works. I'm terrible at communicating unless I have methodical process. You know, when I worked with Make a Wish, they were like, this guy can't even tell, you know, he was on the board. He's like, this guy can't even tell the story about how he met his wife well. Like, there's no way he's going to do this. And it was like watching the, the, the brain man, once he learned the system, he was like, tick, 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 tick. He had everyone t crying about this story about this little kid that was sponsored and got his wish through Make a Wish. I get tingles on my arm just thinking about that story. It still has an impact just hearing it but he was just following a methodical process. The thing that I, the reason why I know introverts can do it is that sales is just like anything else. Like Henry Ford, when he produced the motor car, he didn't say when some bad cars got off the line, oh no, I shouldn't, I was never supposed to build cars. He went, you know what? I need to perfect this production line. 
Sales, networking, it's just a production line. And the reason why I know net introverts do it best is because they're willing to treat it like a production line and continuously improve it. And that is why Henry Ford did so well. He's not, you know, obviously Ford's not doing so well now because other people have copied and done well, but most people in sales just wing things. Now, by the way, if you're an extrovert listening to this, it's not like I'm trying to exclude you. Now, sure, you have your own burdens to bear. So introverts listening, don't think that the extroverts have got it lucky right? They, some might say that they're not the best listeners. They're not the most empathetic. The difference is they believe they can learn those skills. At least the smart ones will go to the effort of learning it. For you as an introvert, you believe you can't. But if you look at, at the science behind it, Brian Tracy will tell you that the top 10% of all sales performers have a planned presentation. Well, planning is something we introverts do really, really well. And what's interesting is, you know, I was on Jeffrey Gittimore's podcast a while back and, you know, usually interviews people for 20 minutes, but he just, exp- I mean, we, we were on that for 80 minutes, that podcast. And, you know, because he was so excited because he'd never really helped extroverts realize that it was only when he started following methodical system that his book started taking off and his ideas started taking off. Because how do you teach? It's easy. Just do this. It's not easy for half the world, the introverts, and the extroverts have their own natural winging at things. So they have to figure it out for themselves. Everybody benefits from a planned presentation. And if you go to globalgurus.com or .org or whatever it is, you will find there's a list of the top 30 sales professionals on that list. And yes, there are a lot of extroverts on that list. I'm honored to be on that list. And I can point to at least 10 other introverts that are on that list. If you don't believe that introverts can succeed because you think you can't, Oprah Winfrey and David Letterman are both introverted. If you think you can't network, Ivan Meisner, the founder of BNI, the world's largest networking group, is an introvert. If you think you can't be dynamic, Bill Murray, the guy that bought us Groundhog Day, is an introvert. You have no excuses except for the excuses that you're creating for yourself. But introverts, plan if, with planning pre- preparation, which means hard work, by the way, for a short period to outperform, that you get to benefit from your entire life. My six weeks of practice, my gosh, look where it's brought me. If you do the work, yes, as an introvert, it will be worth it. And to say whether you can do it, no, I, I'm not saying you can do it. I'm saying you actually will beat the extroverts hands down. Good job. Amazing. <laughs> Matthew, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. This was incredible. I could have talked for easily another hour, but I want to be mindful of everybody's time. And I think we shared so much wisdom here today. Thank you. It was my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. And there you have it, folks, a masterclass from the rapid growth guy, Matthew Pollard. Matthew, it has been an absolute honor to have you on the show to share your unique insights, personal experiences, and electrifying energy with us today. I am sure that all of you listening, just like me, are feeling both inspired and invigorated. I encourage each and every one of you to take that time, take that moment, and let everything that Matthew shared sink in and then put it to work. Growth and success comes from implementing these nuggets of wisdom that we hear from our guests. Do take a moment and check out Matthew's best-selling book, The Introvert's Edge, How the Quiet and Shy Can Outsell Anyone. It is a powerful read that will transform your perception of the quieter ones among us and perhaps help you discover your own introvert's edge. On the next episode of The Brand Gravity Show, we'll continue to unravel the profound mysteries that intertwine business and psychology. But for now, I'm Kay Putnam, your psychology-driven brand strategist, signing off. Keep challenging, keep evolving, and keep building your brand.